Welcome to the Applied Network Forensics course. Here we're looking at chapter one, evidence and data collection and analysis. So what is network forensics? Well, first of all, we have to understand digital forensics before we can discuss network forensics. Digital forensics is typically uh, viewed as the digital forensics and incident response defer overall category. In digital forensics, that's going to be focusing on anything with a digital component, where the evidence is digital. Digital forensics has multiple silos, multiple branches for the different uh, disciplines of specialized forensics, like memory forensics or hard disk forensics or network forensics. There's a plethora of other types of uh, digital forensics, but those are the major ones. So digital forensics has those multiple branches. We're focusing on the sub-branch for networking forensics. That is going to be anything that has the source of evidence being tied to the network. So what's the purpose? Why do we care about network forensics? As our devices have started expanding that communication platform that interconnects all of the devices has also grown. That means we need to understand how to collect data based off of the sharing of information between multiple devices. That is why we study network forensics. So some basic assumptions for this course. The assumption is that you have at least the basic CompTIA A plus network plus type understanding. You understand how PC works. You understand how basic communication works. You understand the seven layers of the OSI model and that you can move, you understand conceptually how data moves between one device to another device. There are some basic hardware requirements also. We have to make sure that you have the ability to install the tools necessary for this course. Things like Wireshark, Network Miner, and a few of the other analysis tools. So that covers the, the basics on how to get started. So what is evidence? And this is important because this is the key of everything that we're doing. We are essentially collecting evidence. Evidence is often defined as something that tends to establish or disproves a fact. User did A, user did B we have to provide facts that either supports our claim or disproves that claim. Since we are talking the legality of proving or disproving facts, we have two big terms when uh, dealing with this, inculpatory and exculpatory. And essentially inculpatory basically says that we have directly supporting evidence stating that we can prove that a fact is a fact. Exculpatory means the opposite. We have evidence that you could not have done it. We have a few types of evidence classifications, and that is whether it be testimonial, it could be t uh, physical, something that's more tangible, or it could be digital evidence. Most of what we're focusing on in this class is digital evidence. The main types of digital evidence are going to be things like fixed disk or removable, memory or, or RAM, logs, network traffic is going to be the focus of our digital evidence for this course. We're going to talk a little bit about logs, but most of what we're focusing on is the uh, network traffic analysis. So again, let's talk about the purpose. Essentially, network forensics, when we're collecting the data, we're being asked some answers to basic questions. Who, what, where, when, how, those are our big ones. So we can get some general type questions like who perpetrated the act that we're trying to force, that we're trying to source. Are there any attributes of their attack? If we say that user A sent an email, can we prove that user A sent that email? Can we see what they've done? Could we see when they did it? Could we see how they did it? 
in the email example, we should be able to, for capturing network traffic, we should be able to see the emails being sent, SMTP. We should be able to see when it happened, when it occurred, where it went to. There should be artifacts, there should be a digital footprint of the data that was sent. All of that is going to be on the wire. On the wire is just a clever way of saying on the network. So some basic common methodologies for data collection is you have to have people that are ready. So when we say common methodology for data collection, here we're talking about the individual person. They have to be prepared. They have to understand how to gather information. They need to understand basic human nature. They have to be ready to act. They have to have a basic understanding of technology. And the individual, the investigator, needs to have some basic deductive reasoning skills. So when we say preparation, what does that mean? Essentially, that means we have the investigator that understands the process that we're going to be going through. They understand how to gather information. They understand how to verify the gathered information and to gather it in such a way where it is not contaminated. They've been trained appropriately and they know what they're doing. That is going to be the basic methodology for data collection. And again, this is focusing on the investigator, not the actual process that they're gonna use. An important part here, when we're talking about the investigator, is the deductive reasoning skills. That's not to be compared with inductive reasoning. They have to be deductive. We need to be able to take a general statement and narrowly focus it down using a logical process to a not general conclusion. We should be able to have a narrowly focused deduction uh, conclusion based off that deductive reasoning. It should not be a general statement. It should be able to narrow it down. So how do they, the investigators, process evidence? How do they actually go through and verify that they're doing it correctly. There's multiple ways, and in our reading, we have a few that we're gonna discuss. The first one is Tara. And with Tara, that's trigger, acquire, analysis, report, and then action. So essentially, something had to trigger the investigation. And we haven't really talked about triggers, that's actually part of chapter two, is what begins the investigation. But that's the thing, there is a formalized process that has to occur for the investigation to begin. Next, we have to acquire, that's gonna be where data collection occurs, evidence collection occurs. We collect as much evidence as possible, and then we will analyze the collected evidence. We will generate a report, and we, using the TAR sequence, will then give a plan of action. What do we do? And again, that could be part of the reporting uh, aspect, but it just kind of depends on the situation. Another very common one is OSCAR. And that is, again, you're gonna notice the same general steps, obtain information, that's gonna be prior to data collection, this is going to be more of a understanding what triggered the event. We're going to strategize, prioritize. We know, for an example, we can know that we are investigating a individual that is being accused of violating company policy about instant messaging and transferring of files. So that means we're going to brush up on the protocols used for transferring of files. We will strategize, we'll prioritize what we're gonna be looking for. Maybe setting a timeline. Narrowing that timeline based off of our initial investigation. That is when we can start the collection, the collecting of evidence, the data collection portion. From there, we can analyze what we've collected, then generate a report. You'll notice here, the last step is report because we're not giving a plan of action, we're showing either 
we're supporting our claim or not supporting our claim. NIST has their own general DFIR process, that's Identify, Process, Analyze, Report. You're going to notice that the common processes are always going to be the same, which is essentially Identify, Process, that's going to be where data collection occurs, Analyze what's been collected, make a report based off of what you found in the collected data. The general or more common sense of what we're doing is we're trying to figure out the W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. That, that's the overall general process of what we're trying to accomplish. So where can we pull network evidence from? Well, we can tap the wire, the physical connection. We can pull it out of the air, wireless. We could be looking at a switch's cam table, looking at MAC addresses. We could be looking at a router's routing table. We could be looking at network infrastructure services like DHCP and DNS logs. Maybe looking at authentication server logs. Maybe looking at overall system logs, just kind of depends. Looking at security appliances like IDSs, IPSs, or firewall logs. Or we could even be looking at proxy server logs. All of these are going to generate logs that we could be using to analyze and collect data. So NIST also outlined three key areas for understanding data collection. They call it CIA, Capture, Identify, and Analyze. Again, basically we do data collection, we identify what was collected in the data collection process, then we analyze it. One of the key principles that we use in digital forensics or in forensics in general is the Luckard's exchange principle. And basically this was the foundation of the scientific technique in forensics processing. And essentially what he came up with is that a person or an object that will either enter or leave a crime scene will either leave something behind or will leave some with something from the scene. So any type of interaction with the scene should leave a trace that you were there. And those are called artifacts. So the entire purpose of our forensics process is to find those artifacts. We have a few threat possibilities, threat identification. We always discuss like attackers, someone from outside the network trying to attack us. Those are gonna be external threats. We could also have internal threats. Those are going to be workers inside the organization that have a beef with the organization. Or we can have a hybrid, someone that could be working on the inside that's being played by someone on the outside or they have common attributes between both external and internal. They could be socially engineered and become a threat without even realizing it. Earlier we talked about artifacts. Again, data traces or data artifacts are just going to be portions of data that are left for forensics investigators to find. Whether we're talking about artifacts on a, on a storage disk, whether it be artifacts in a system log or a, a switch log proving that certain data was sent at certain times. All of this is called digital footprinting. So how does one of these threats actually exploit the network? Well, networks have vulnerabilities. They have physical and physical security vulnerabilities. They have basic natural disasters. They have sometimes poor network design, all of these lead to possible vulnerabilities of the network. Even just having humans play a part of the network provide a certain level of vulnerability to that network. One of the big ones is standards, procedures, uh, policies. Those actually are the big ones tied with people that create these vulnerabilities 
because we may think that we're safe, but in reality we're not because we don't have the appropriate policies and procedures to protect us. So moving on, we have three best practices for evidence handling. Chain of custody. So when data is collected from the scene to the court, we have to prove that who had access to that data. We have to make sure that the data was not manipulated or changed or altered in some way. We have to prove the integrity of the data. We have to show that we picked up evidence A from the crime scene and we were able to analyze it, again, proving the chain of custody, who had access to it the entire way through the system, all the way up until the court date. We can also uh, provide verification of certain digital evidence by providing hash validation. Hashes are a one-way algorithm that verify the in data integrity of a system or a piece of data or other objects. Hashing is, should be unique so that no hashing of two items can yield the same hash value. We'll get a little bit more into hashing later in a later chapter, but hashing validation is crucial for verifying that we have what we have. Lastly, documentation. Everything that we are doing when we are touching the evidence, we're documenting. Also, we're never working off of the original evidence. We will collect the original evidence we will hash the original evidence. We will work off a copy of the original evidence. How can we verify the copy is identical? We will provide a hash of the original data and we'll provide a hash of the copy of the data. We will compare the hash values and if they are the same, then we know that the, the evidence we're working off the copy of is identical to the original data. Lastly, we have to talk about some basic or general rules of evidence collection. One, mishandling of the evidence destroys the evidence flat out, meaning things without chain of custody, for example, are no longer ex acceptable. If you try to present findings in court of evidence that was mishandled, it's gone. It's, it's thrown out. Rule two. Again, we never work off original evidence. We work off of copies that are verified identical to the original. And lastly, we make sure to document everything. What did we do? Why did we do it? Why did we touch it? What time of day it was? We document as much as possible so that anyone coming behind us can duplicate the exact same steps if they follow what we've done. And they can follow it because we document every single thing. All right, that is actually it for the chapter one review. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. Thank you.